insurance products in your community. Get on board, get on track, get to where you're going. And now, your Edutrainer, National Insurance Columnist, Steve Savant. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Steve Savant. I'm host of the Business Insurance Zone, and I'm a national insurance columnist all over the web. But what I'm here to do today is to be your coach and mentor in the entry level to life insurance. Our whole entire workshop for the next couple months is brought to you by Lincoln Benefit Life, an Allstate company. And their site is over here, www.lblsales.com forward slash ETW. The reason we bring this up is because you'll want to go to the Eclipse Illustration software, hit the Run Installer, and download. About a week from now, when we start using their software, you'll want to have this already on your computer. So when I'm showing you how things work and how it actually you can do proposals and kind of weigh in on some of the ideas that you want to do, you'll be able to go ahead and track with me um, for illustration to illustration. Now today I want to kind of open up while we're talking about basic ideas of life insurance. And I want to give you a little history before we really get into the class. And I want to go to our whiteboard. And from now on, for maybe this week, I'm just going to give you a little math, show you how I think a kind of, a, kind of an icebreaker for our class. And the first thing I want to show you is something really unique. It's called block math and mechanics. Basically, this is the way we used to do math back in the day. And I'm talking way before my time. And this is called block math and mechanics. And I'm going to choose another color here to kind of offset it. Let's say we wanted to do 85 times 85. Now, of course, the way we learned it, this is how we do mathematics in this way. 85 squared, you just go 85 times 85. Now, here's the way we used to do it. 5 times 8 is 40. 8 times 8 is 64. 8 times 5 is 40. And eight times, uh, <laughs> eight times 25, I knew I could do it. So what I do is then I take that number. And remember, if you have three numbers times two numbers, just make the grid bigger or smaller. And the total in this triangle is the number five. The total in this trapezoid is two. The total in this trapezoid is 16 and, or I'm sorry, 12, <laughs> 12, 12, there you go. And one is seven. It should be 72, 25. And if I did the same math over here, it'd be five times five is 25. Five times eight is 40, carry the two. Eight times five is 40. Eight times eight is 64 plus the four gives me 68. And my total then is 7225. Now, I'm not saying this is kind of old hand and it takes a lot longer to do. But before we looked at this kind of way of doing the multiplication, this is the way we did it. Now, why do I tell you this? Because all this week, as you're coming into life insurance, we're going to have to stretch a little bit of how you think about life insurance and what you think is really, how do I get into this business? Is it something that I think I can build out my practice? If you're coming from the medical field or you're coming from property casualty, perhaps the bank, maybe even securities, life insurance is a great business builder. It'll enhance your practice. So. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to, to our site so that you can always see our number again. I want you to go on www.lblsales.com forward slash ETW so that you can pull down that software because next week we're going to need it. Now I want to give you a little history. I've noticed that in the good book, before the great flood declared in the book of Genesis, it seemed like people lived excessively. The mortality was just huge. And the oldest person written in sacred text is a guy named Methuselah who lived 969 years, at least according to the Bible. But after the flood, it's this post-Diluvian period, I noticed a marked decline, not only in the biblical record, but when history started picking up these numbers. In fact, at the apex of the Roman Empire, think about this, the average mortality for a male in the Roman Empire was age 25. Remarkable. It wasn't until later on, somewhere in the 1500s, that a gentleman named Ponce de Leon started trafficking and trying to find the Fountain of Youth down in Florida. He felt that that was there and he was looking for it and searching for it. And at that time when Ponce de Leon was looking for the Fountain of Youth, right around that time, the average age got to about age 37. Now by the time we meet the first person that actually imagined pricing human life 
on longevity or a timeline or life expectancy, Sir Edmund Haley. Now, of course, you know him as the great astronomer who discovered the comet, consequently named after him. But what you may not know about Sir Edmund Haley is he's really the first one to construct, design, and actually use a working model for life insurance pricing, something we still basically use today. So when you think about looking into the heavens tonight and you, you see the stars and you think about Sir Edmund Haley's comment, remember he's the one that actually figured out, hey, here's our first actuarial table so that we can price human longevity and figure out how much that costs. Now, things have changed quite a bit and at the time of Sir Edmund Haley's uh, lifetime, the average age in England was about 47. So you can see we went from the Roman Empire at 25 and it took us almost 1600 years or so to get all the way up to age 47 as an average. Now it's interesting, by the time we got to the United States and we were actually using, I think it was First Presbyterian was the first company, I think the first mutual company was the New England in 1850. So we've had life insurance in the United States for a long time and the government has always accommodated some tax advantages with it, which even makes it greater because they feel this is a great social benefit. Now I looked at some of the early uh, 19 CSOs and that's the Commissioner's Standard Operational Tables. These tables, believe it or not, actually will score out male and female and they'll take your life expectancy, plot it on a line, and the first one that I saw was the 1941 CSO. The 1941 Commissioner Standard Operational Tables are used for Social Security. So perhaps there's really nothing wrong with Social Security, it's just that the 1941 CSO is so antiquated, it really, we should have been dying by the time we were 62. But then we moved on to the 1958 Commissioner Standard Operational Tables. And at that time, it was a major stretch to have a contract that went all the way out to 85, oh my goodness, even 90. By the time I came into the business, we had transferred from the 1958 CSO model to the 1980, and we stayed on that platform for a long time. Consider this, when I came into the life insurance business, you were either a smoker or a non-smoker. You were male, female, there was no preferreds, we didn't deal with any other kind of product but whole life or term. And most of the term back in the day was more ART, annual renewable term. So, so many things have happened from the last 30 years. We've added huge amounts of different health classifications. Consider that we're at super preferred, we do preferred plus, we do preferred non-smoke, we do standard plus, and we do standard. Five different health categories just for non-smoking and then even in the smoking realm we have preferred non-smoker and regular tobacco user and actually pricing that has to do with specific types of tobacco like snuff, pipe, chew, cigar. So when we look at all the things that have happened and how we micromanage your Chem 24 exam, think about it, we're pricing what it costs to cover you, to indemnify you on a timeline. That timeline is a price tag that some actuary has figured out the ratio of how many people will die at that age given their specific health. Now when you think about it, the 1980 CSO, we were really, we thought we were stretching ourselves at the time and we went all the way out to age 95. That was the average endowment and or maturity date of these contracts that were permanent. Sometime in the 80s, we started to introduce universal life. It was supposed to be a combination of term and investment, or actually a saver's interest rate. And at the time that we invented this, it was very expensive on the inside uh, uh, internal costs, and the interest rates are awful high. But by the time I took three or 400 basis points of costs off the top, and I was left with maybe eight to 9% net return, that looked great. But of course, interest rates just collapsed over the last 20, 25 years. And so those numbers that we showed didn't really pan out. And so we have to be very careful when we're pricing things because things can change. We added so many things to the plate. Besides whole life and term, term went to guaranteed level. It went five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, 25, 30, and we even have 40 year level term today. And everybody has graduated from the 1980 CSO to the new standard 2001 CSO, which some of these contracts, the maturity dates go out to 121, and some language in some of the contracts actually say that the endowment or the maturity date of life insurance goes all the way out to the phrase, 
life of the insured. So they don't even put a number on it. They're saying the life of the insured is the one that dictates that. So it could go on into perpetuity. So what we're looking for now is since the timelines are getting longer, since we're living longer, the price of life insurance is coming down. As an example of math, and I think this is unbelievable, I can take a 25-year-old, super preferred female, her actual $75 non-commissionable policy fee in most carriers, there's a few that pay commission on it, but her $75 policy fee on $100,000, think of it, her annual premium is actually a little less than her policy fee. So you can have a female that's super preferred and her 10-year term for $100,000 is less than 150 bucks, of which $75 of that money is a policy fee. So it's a not remarkable. And we may have to actually move up and have minimum thresholds of a, a set of 100,000. We might have to start moving up to 150 to 200,000 because the pricing is so cheap in short term and because we're using uh, uh, younger ages, they're gonna have to probably escalate or increase the minimum face. We'll see if that actually happens. It's interesting. We're living so much longer and it's affecting our business. Every day, Willard Scott says happy birthday to a handful of Americans that turn 100. If Willard took the time to say happy birthday to everybody that's turning 100, it would take us 90 minutes a day, 365 days a year. That is what's happening. The geriatric market, the growth in that demographic is so huge in what we call now the Centurion Club. So people that are turning 100, and consider this, I can't remember what magazine I read this in, but they said a person that's going to live to 150 is already born and on the planet. So when we think about all that's happening in mortality and pricing and life insurance, we're gonna introduce you to all the concepts, and part of that is this thing called the mortality revolution. It's impacting the way we think. Consider this, at the year 2000, we had a handful of tricenturians, people who were born in the 1898 or 1899, who had lived the whole 20th century and were still living as they came. We had people that were actually 100 plus years old, tricenturians, born in the 1800s, lived throughout the 1900s, and then migrated into the 2000s. The Guinness Book of World Records, this, this woman from France, I mean, when you think about the numbers we're talking about, and these are staggering numbers. When you're looking at her numbers, they're looking like, I think that girl, I can't remember her name because I can't speak French very well, but her numbers, when you look at 119 years, 121 years, and we have about a handful, about a dozen people right now that are 115 years, and we're going to see the book of records fall within the next decade. Consider all the medical technology of extension of life. And there are certain pockets in the world where you see extraordinary mortality. Some people look at the Georgia province region of the former Soviet Union. Some look at the island in Japan, down in Okinawa. There's extraordinary, what are they eating? What's their culture like? We're expanding and pulling the timeline. We're just expanding the entire life expectancy to such numbers today that it's reasonable to think that the generation, my children's generation, that many of the females that stay non-smoker, preferred, or better are all gonna see age 100. It's something that we have to look at, and remember this as a kind of an idea and a close for today's session. Second to die in the entire 20th century, with all carriers in the United States, had somewhere around less than 500 death claims. Now, we, the males died according to the, to the 1980 CSO, which is the dominant amount of business that was written on that. But remember, we don't pay a, a death claim until the second death. So it's amazing to me, and should be amazing to us, that many of the carriers who thought they were gonna have death claims actually second to die or survivorship, and we'll get into all that coming up in our classes weeks to come that didn't experience the death claims because we're living longer. The longer we live, the smaller the premium becomes, and now we're guaranteed term out to 40 years. When we come back tomorrow in our class, we're gonna start talking about some of the concepts, the basic understanding of it. We're talking about life insurance, and today was your first history lesson about life. This has been an edutrainment workshop, the educational division of the National Insurance Clearinghouse the marketing arm of Brokers Alliance, and sponsored by Lincoln Benefit Life, an Allstate company.